Well, I want to welcome to the program Joe Heschmeyer. Joe is a staff apologist at Catholic Answers. Joe, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Joe, that's a pretty cool title. Staff <laughs> apologist. Yeah, yeah I, I give defenses for staffs. No, uh, it's, you know, nice. and so for those who don't know, uh, apologist comes from the Greek word for defense, apologia, which is also strangely enough where we get the word apology. But it's not like we're saying sorry, it's like we're explaining why we're Catholic. So that's what I get to do all day, every day. It's, it's wonderful. It's what I was doing in my free time, I now do for my full time job, which is uh, you never work a day in your life. I, isn't that awesome, right? When yeah. your work can align with your sense of deepest passion and mission. And oh, by the way, you can get a paycheck, right? <laughs> exactly. Is, I mean, I, I just really tell cool. people like, think of your hobby and imagine somebody who's decided to pay you a full-time salary to do your hobby all yeah. the time. Yeah. And you do it more, you know, like you have to do your hobby now, but you want to do your hobby. And so it, it really is that. It really is it's such a blessing. It's such a joy. I feel like I'm exactly where I was meant to be. Okay. So I want to know, did your like uh, your passion for apologetics, was that it all connected to your um, growth in faith? Um, oh, I, absolutely. I want to so, hear that story. Yeah. Well, I was a debater. So I was already a debater before I entered debate. My mom will tell you that. So she had the wisdom when I was like 14 to get me into high school debate. She had to pull some strings because the class was full and it was a life change. Uh, so I, I debated all throughout high school, debate paid for college, and then after that, I went to law school. And so I had this, you know, very particular kind of trajectory. I ended up becoming a litigator. But along the way, I kept having these moments that got me to take the Catholic claim more seriously. So we'd grown up Catholic and my parents made sure we went to mass every Sunday and we would listen to, uh, at the time we didn't really have Catholic radio. So we'd listen to Protestant radio. So I had a weird kind of confusion about a lot of theological questions. Uh, having gotten a little bit of Catholicism, a little bit of Protestantism, and not really knowing who teaches what and why. Uh, but then my RA uh, in college was an old friend of mine from high school who had actually grown up with, and he was three years ahead of me. He's a priest now, and he was on fire for his Catholic faith. So we would debate in a really kind of friendly way. I'd just ask him some, you know, smart alecky question about like why the Catholic Church <laughs> teaches this, that, or the other thing. And he would very charitably, very gently destroy my argument and then give me books if I needed them to learn more. And, but it was clear he wasn't just trying to win the argument. He was, he really was in love with the truth. And this was so inspiring and contagious. And so flash forward a few years. And by this point, I'm in law school and I'm starting to really delve into a lot of this stuff myself. I'm reading the church fathers. I'm doing all this stuff when I probably should be, you know, preparing for, you know, legal exams and all, all that. But I, I'm just, I'm finding all of this cool stuff about the Catholic faith I'd never known before. And I can't stop reading about it. And worse, I can't stop talking about it. And so all of my friends who are, you know, not Catholic or not at this place in their journey are just being driven nuts. Cause I'm like, I want to talk about John six. I want to talk about like this Eucharistic, like I didn't even know this was here. I want to. And so there were all of those kind of issues. So honestly, and I started the, my blog, Shameless Popery in 2009 while I was in law school, just to have an outlet where I could talk apologetics to people who wanted to talk about it. And, you know, I thought this way, friends and family who want to discover some of this stuff won't be uh, feeling on the defensive. They can just kind of read it on their own time, however they want. And I'll just do it for a little while. And when I run out of steam, then I'll stop. And I, that point hasn't happened yet. So... <laughs> All right. So uh, I want to see if uh, this ever happened to you. So when my faith came alive, I was uh, 18. I uh, grew up in a Catholic home, but I was challenged uh, about my Catholic faith that I was told I was going to hell because I was Catholic. And um, I ended up through the wonderful uh, support of my uh, pastor, my priest, to learn how to read the Bible in a Catholic way. And that immediately turned me to, oh, let me go find out about growing in faith. At that time, radio was Christian radio, mm -hmm. and Catholics would buy time on it. And I bumped into this show that was just plucking Catholics out of the air because they would take in calls and these simple like old women Catholics would call up and say, but I thought this was the truth. And he would just just cut their Catholic faith up into pieces and then say, hold on the line and we'll get you connected to a real Christian church. And I would get so mad. I would call them up and I'd ask unanswerable questions, uh, you know, the way that Catholics can. And so I was kind of snarky about it, but I would say, 
Good morning, Pastor. How do you know the Bible's inspired? Second Peter 1.19 says, all scripture is inspired, right? And then I'd say, well, Pastor, how do you know that First Peter's inspired, right? And, and then he gets so mad at me. They actually cut him off the air wow. because he got so mad at my poking at him to come up with answers to questions that he didn't know how to answer because he didn't have really good answers. Um, so let's just say that maybe I was doing a good thing in a bad way. I wasn't okay. very charitable about it. So uh, anyway, so I had to learn. I had to learn how to engage in the work of apologetics in a way that, I don't know, wasn't trying to prove that I was right and they were wrong. Yeah, it's more than just knowing the right answer. It's knowing how to present the truth in love. You know, that's what we're called to do as Christians. So you have to know the truth. It is not negotiable that you know your faith. But knowing your faith is necessary, but it's not sufficient. By itself, that's not good enough. You know, the devil knows Catholic teaching better than you do. And so if it's just a theology quiz, he's going to outdo you. And so there's something more than that, you know, obviously the growth in charity, but the growth, even in just how you present the truth charitably is something that I think a lot of people struggle with and including me. I mean, you just heard I had eight years as a debater and then three years in law school and then I was a litigator. So to say I have like an argumentative spirit by nature is probably an understatement. Mm -hmm. And so it, it is this kind of lifelong battle of like keeping that in check uh, to not just tear someone apart, even if I think I see all the weak points in their argument to respect them as a daughter or son of God and, and treat them like that. Uh, that, you know, I, I've been very influenced by thinkers like Blaise Pascal, who talk about how basically winning the, the argument and not the person mm -hmm. doesn't do anything. Ben Franklin has a line that a man persuaded against his will is of the same opinion still. <laughs> Meaning like if he hasn't consented to have his mind changed, He'll hold to his old view, even if you have in your own mind totally debunked it, even if you've presented unanswerable arguments, he's going to keep believing the thing he believed beforehand, unless you can, can get a little bit of openness in that. Now, some of that only the Holy Spirit can do, but some of that we can, we can grease the skids a little bit by, by not being needlessly combative. I like that. That's really, that's well said. I like that quote from Ben Franklin. I'm going to steal it, make pretend I discovered it. So thank you for that, <laughs> exactly. Joe. Uh, I'm talking with Joe Heschmeyer today. He is the author of a book we're going to dig into right now. The early church was the Catholic church. And Joe, I was really excited to, to dig into this book. And um, as, as good as the title is, the book is even better. Okay. It, the book is even better. I'm serious. Um, as I dug into what you were saying in, in the introductory, uh, the introduction to the book, and then you started to break it open over the course of those main sections of the book, um, you do something that I've always wondered why more apologists don't emphasize, which is having everyone pause and say, let's take a look at how warranted your interpretation of a particular scripture is based on the history of interpretations. Like how early, how often, how consistent is what you believe found in the earliest writings of the church? And it's it it I haven't found a single book of apologetics that made that its point of focus. So, uh, first of all, where did you come up with the 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 idea behind the early church was the Catholic Church? And um, and let's let's dive in from there. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, well, there are a few different things. One, it, it's kind of a convoluted story, but I, I kept noticing these issues in which Protestant reformers in particular would break with what everyone for 1500 years had believed. And so there's this pretty famous account Martin Luther has in which he describes later in life how early as a reformer, he'd been nagged by this doubt, are you alone wise? And this is something he was criticized for by all of his opponents, even you know Henry VIII and people, not just people who were good Catholics, but everyone was sort of like, well, where do you get off saying, you know better than everyone else who came before you? And when you read Luther's writings, so this is, this is the thing that I think is really remarkable when you compare Protestants trying to salvage and defend Luther with like what Luther says about himself. So you'll find these Protestants today who say, well, Luther wasn't that radical. But then when you read Luther about himself, he totally sees himself as radical. He compares himself to Noah, who's the only one just left on earth. I mean, he that's in his commentary on Genesis. That's how he posits himself. 
in relation not just to the Christians of his day, but even in relationship to the church fathers. He lumps them all with like the evil generation. And so when you see that, it's kind of like, well, wait a second. That's so out there. That's so shocking. Uh, why don't more people know about this? And a lot of the reason I think that more people don't know about it is that people don't know about the church fathers. So some of this was just me having, I already mentioned this, you know, having discovered the church fathers and getting really into them and reading them and realizing how Catholic they were. I was really enriched by that. Reading the reformers and seeing what a break with the church fathers this was, even when they would sometimes play, pay lip service to the church fathers, that was really radical. And then just think about the implications of that. You know, if we're going to say that the entire church, every Christian on earth or every visible denomination or church or body on earth for 1500 years could get it wrong, why not 2000 years? Why not 3000 years? Why would we believe that there's any, you know, because the reformers claim isn't just that Catholic theology isn't perfect. It's that Catholics are heretics or even idolaters. Mm -hmm. And so if the entire church, if the entire body of Christ fell into heresy and idolatry, well, who's to say we're not still all in heresy and idolatry now and that no, no true Christians have existed yet? And that claim strikes me as so fatal to the Christian claim and so outlandish at the same time that it, it seems worth kind of addressing. So that was kind of like one of the major uh, impetuses for, for writing. The other is, is realizing a certain commonality that I would see all over the place from more, so to speak, progressive Catholics, but also from Protestants and also from people like Dan Brown, the Da Vinci Code guy. And uh, you see even like Thomas Jefferson, these people who have very little in common, all would have the same basic argument that like, oh, you know, I reject Catholic teaching, but I really like the teachings of Jesus. It's just somewhere along the way, those teachings got corrupted. And I would hear this ad nauseum from people who hadn't actually read any early Christian writings and whose knowledge of church history jumped from like the first century to the 16th century or to the 21st century. And, and so it was like, well, okay, you're making historical claims. You're saying somewhere along the way, there was this historical alteration that a teaching was added or removed or changed or corrupted. When and where did that happen? Because this isn't just a theological claim that you think it's a bad change, not a good one. It's also a, a factual historical claim that you think th there, there was a change at some point in history. And this is one of, you know, you, you use the uh, phrase unanswerable questions. One of those that I've found in my own experience is just asking people like, well, who do you think was the first Pope? And occasionally they'll have like a person they think, you know, oh, Constantine started the papacy. And you're just like, okay, well, here, here's a lot of evidence from before Constantine that, that wasn't true. But more often than not, they don't really have a theory at all. They've never really thought about it deeply enough. And so it was one of those areas where I had been personally enriched by it. And I saw the intellectual and theological damage being done by people not knowing about early Christianity. So I know it's kind of a long answer. But I think those, those were kind of the focal points that, that led to, to writing the book. Well, and Joe, I, I, I like the way that you um, narrowed it down to the first two centuries, because when I've engaged with um, Protestants in conversation around the foundations of their faith and the basis for their idea that somehow the, the Catholic Church is a corruption of authentic Christian faith, they point to Constantine and Augustine. So Augustine, uh, and there was, I remember I was, I looked at a, uh, like I was looking at a, 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 a catalog of books and it was how Augustine was actually a Lutheran. And <laughs> I was, this proves that Augustine was really a Lutheran. And I'm thinking, wow, that is so interesting. But it gets at, it gets at the idea that underlies a lot of reformed theology that somehow the Catholic church post Constantine warped what a got at least up to augustine we had right and and luther was recovering what had been lost yeah so those two figures constantine and augustine are pivotal for a lot of protestants it's kind of their their version of church history which is why in the book i call it the preteen years before constantine before augustine <laughs> it doesn't work if you say augustine's name right but augustine is how a lot of protestants say it so yeah. augustine and constantine and then you say oh, okay the preteen years we'll go before those guys because you're right like reformed protestants tend to love augustine uh he's cited more than 100 times in john calvin's institutes of christian religion 
but a lot of Protestants and more evangelical, non-denominational, sometimes the charismatic kind of wings of Protestantism view him with a lot of suspicion because he's so systematic in his thinking uh, that they say, oh, you know, he's way too sacramental. He's, he's a bishop. He's, and all that stuff's true. He lays out the 73 book canon. He does. So they, they often reject him for being way too Catholic and will even claim that's where a lot of this stuff comes from. You know, he talks about having mass said for his mother after she dies. And they're like, oh, look at how, you know, this is all this pagan stuff creeping in. It's like, no, 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 that had been going on way before Augustine. And it, it was going on from people being killed by the pagans for not being pagan. So, you know, it's, it's <laughs> like just setting the record straight because you're right. Like if you were to ask moderately educated Christians, like name an early Christian outside of the Bible, mm-hmm. Augustine's name would probably be the number one on the list. And, and only slightly less controversial is Constantine, and only slightly because he's less well-known. But he's also very controversial because of his role in church history and world history. So I'm talking today with Joe Heschmeyer. He's the author of the book, The Early Church Was the Catholic Church. And I want you folks to consider uh, getting this book if you have any interest at all in digging into the earliest of the Christian writers, the earliest of the church fathers, to see what they had to say about really the the most foundational aspects of living out our Catholic faith. Joe goes into baptism, the Holy Eucharist, the the concept of apostolic succession, and inspired writings, especially the four Gospels, and what did it mean to live as a Christian in the earliest years? You can see, you can get it on catholic.com. If you click on the shop link, you'll get right to the ability to type in the book, The Early Church Was the Catholic Church. So Joe, um, in, uh, in the earliest part of the book, you talk about, hey, what do we know about these earliest of writers? And you focus in on Polycarp, Irenaeus, and, and I like how you're able to identify elements that, again, people just take for granted. They don't really maybe have pondered or thought about that, wait a minute, they, they take for granted this idea that there's sort of no information out there about what happened after the time of the apostles. But I like how you bring out the fact that, no, wait a minute, we have links to the apostles themselves, and I'll let you pick it up from there. Yeah. So, you know, as you've already said, the focus of the book is what can we show was the Christian view of Eucharist, baptism, bishops, absolute succession, the Gospels before the year 200. And for a lot of people, it's like, well, do we know anything about the Christians back then? It's like, yeah, we do. And in fact, we have good reason to think that they were well informed about what the apostles taught. So I look at, as you said, two people in particular, St. Polycarp of Smyrna and St. Irenaeus of Lyon. Now, I look at Polycarp in part because we know a decent amount about his uh, the years in which he lived, because uh, a year after he is martyred, there is a, a work called The Martyrdom of Polycarp written by eyewitnesses to his martyrdom who record what happened. And one of the things that he says when he's being asked to deny Christ, he says, 80 and six years have I served him and he never did me any injury. How then can I blaspheme my king and my savior? So If he was a Christian for 86 years, then at a minimum, he was 86 years old. He's either referring to his lifespan or to the time since his baptism, or if he was baptized as an infant, to both. And so we know, uh, based on the dating of Martyrdom and Polycarp, that it was written in 156, less than a year after his death in 155, which means that Polycarp lived from the year 69 to the year 155. Why does that matter? Because Polycarp and Ignatius of Antioch are the two known followers or disciples of the Apostle John. And John dies around the year 100. Polycarp by that point would have been 31 years old. So he's a full grown man who has listened to the last living apostle preach and present Christianity. And so Polycarp has not just the biblical text, he's got the author of multiple books of the New Testament, who he can actually ask, well, what was it like when, what did Jesus mean by this? What did you see there? What did you mean? (laughs) Why did you include this detail? Why did you say John 6 happened at Passover time? Why did you, you know, like, what was the big deal behind the inclusion of this and not that? He has for decades, the ability to ask those kind of questions. Mm -hmm. And he's doing this in, in, in Smyrna, which is one of the churches mentioned in the book of Revelation. It's one of the good ones. 
And, and this is all happening in this, in this close proximity. The churches in Revelation, for those who aren't familiar, these churches in the area called Asia Minor, and they seem to have been uh, especially connected to the Apostle John, which is why Jesus gives messages to John to those seven local churches. And one of them is Smyrna. And so he, there seems to have been a real intimate relationship between John and Polycarp. And we know Polycarp died this faithful death of a martyr. That's one step. The second step is to St. Irenaeus of Lyon. Irenaeus is the first Christian source we have telling us the four Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Irenaeus is a student of Polycarp's. Uh, he is a, a hearer of Polycarp in his own words, just as Polycarp was a hearer of John. So he's a, a student of a student of the Apostles. And uh, there's this fascinating interaction. One of Polycarp's other students ends up becoming a heretic. He becomes a Gnostic. And there's a letter that Irenaeus writes to him that basically amounts to saying, look, you and I both learned Christianity from Polycarp, and we know he didn't teach Gnosticism. That's really cool because you can't do that much later on in history. Once you get a, like further and further removed, it's less compelling to say, well, you know, this isn't what my dad taught me, or this isn't what, you know, <laughs> the local priest told me or what my pastor told me. No, but when the guy who's telling you it actually learned it from the Apostle John, it carries a lot of weight. So he can still do that. The, the idea here is what someone's called living memory. That living memory is when someone was alive who either uh, witnessed it or knew the eyewitnesses of it or knew the people who knew the eyewitnesses. And once you get beyond that, you're really past the scope of living memory and you're, you're basically confined to what's in the written record or what do we have other records of because it, it becomes a game of telephone. Well, you're not really with the game of telephone when it's just, I got it from Polycarp or got it from John. It, it's so, you know, every step of that, you know, the reliability of every step. Well, Polycarp, excuse me, Irenaeus, as I said, uh, is born in 130. And so he's about 25 when Polycarp is martyred. So again, you have the adult follower of an adult follower of the disciples. And so the question is, can we count on these people to get Christianity right? And I argue in the book, yes, because to say that heresy, so let's, let's be clear here, heresy existed in the early church. We, you know, the New Testament talks about the dangers of heresy. And I just mentioned one of Polycarp's other students becomes a heretic. So I'm not arguing heresy is impossible this early on, and it is. In fact, Irenaeus' most famous book is called Against Heresies, in which he just argues against the Gnostic heresy. But what is still possible is that when heresy pops up, it can't overwhelm apostolic Christianity because we're too close to the time of the apostles and people know what the apostles taught. Because I'm using the example of John, Polycarp, and Irenaeus, but the truth is that there were probably many other people who had these kind of personal relationships with the apostles or with those who knew the apostles and who could serve as a check to erroneous understandings of the Bible. That if you're understanding John one way and someone who knew John says, no, he didn't mean it that way at all, that's an important corrective to just going off the text alone. Mm -hmm. Now, John, again, that's it, it provides a tremendous service to folks who want to feel that, again, that sense of it's a reasonable thing to say that Catholic belief has witnesses mm -hmm. in the earliest of the, of the writers and the earliest witnesses uh, of our faith beyond the apostles themselves. And you do that in this wonderful book, The Early Church Was the Catholic Church. I'm going to show the link again on catholic.com and go under shop and you'll get access to this book. Joe, you make a, uh, some points early on in the book about the way in which the church was very conservative, meaning that it had a natural sense of preserving with authenticity that which was handed on to them, drawing upon the principle of, of tradition in the book. And it is, again, a beautiful way of bolstering a, a Catholic way of understanding the way that faith is handed on. Um, and so I love the way you did that. And I'd love to go from there into the chapter on baptism, because you do a wonderful job of showing the New Testament references to baptism. But then how do you sort it out? What does it all mean? How do you carry on? What was the actual teaching and how that um, was played out in the earliest, in, in the first two centuries? Yeah. So it, it's one of the things, just to make sure people understand that when we're talking about conservatism here, we don't mean anything like right wing versus left wing. We mean that the faith is delivered once for all to the apostles, as it says in Jude 1, 3. That there's not this process. You know, if you're dealing with like physics, you're constantly acquiring new data you didn't have yesterday. And that's, that's the point of that field of endeavor. 
But with theology, it's not like that. We're not constantly getting new revelation. We're hopefully growing and understanding what we've already received, but we're not looking for some new, there's not going to be another book of the Bible. There's not going to be a, another Testament. There's not going to be another prophet. You know, like none of those things. Like uh, in many and various ways, God spoke by our forefathers, but now he's spoken by the son. And that's the definitive word. So our job is that of preservation and of deepening our understanding. Our job is not to change the teaching. It's not to get some new teaching. So that's the, the idea of theological conservatism, which is that anyone saying that the Catholic Church added or removed a teaching, the obvious hurdle there is just that the earliest Christians we find hate the idea of doctrinal novelty. They hate the idea. Now, that doesn't automatically prove that they didn't fall into some heresy on accident, but it should at least call into question the idea they're just willy-nilly picking up new teachings from paganism or the world or their own ideas or whatever else. So, that's one reason we should be able to trust them. And one of the issues upon which I think we should be able to trust them is baptism. And we see St. Paul presenting this as a basic doctrine. You know, he talks about one Lord, one faith, one baptism in Ephesians 4. He treats it as just sort of something that everybody knows, everybody gets. This is one of those, this is uh, not spiritual meat. This is more milk that like even, even the little kids in the faith get this. This is something the newbies understand. And so the question we should be asking is, okay, well, if Paul seems to think the early Christians understand baptism well, what did the early Christians understand about baptism? Because it seems like we should be able to trust it, given what Paul says. And just to, uh, to step in here, yeah. one of the reasons why this is what you're saying, folks, as you're listening to Joe talk right now, is that for so many Protestants, and uh, they consider the concept of being born again as not equivalent to baptism. And so this is such a critical thing to understand and how, what Joe, what you're gonna be laying out here in terms of New Testament evidence associated with being born again in its relationship to the reality of baptism. Yeah, so I actually begin the chapter by giving a definition from a, a group called the Barna Group, which is a, like an evangelical polling firm. And they wanted to know what born again Christians had to say about a certain thing, but their definition of a born again a Christian was someone who had made a personal commitment to Jesus Christ that was still important in their life today. And it was a three-pronged definition, because uh, it also meant that they believed that when they die, they'll go to heaven because they confessed their sins and had accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So none, none of that referred to baptism at all, but the language of born again comes from the Bible, and it comes from John 3, where Jesus says to Nicodemus, unless one is born anew or born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then he clarifies what he means by that. He says, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So the earliest Christians understood that unanimously, universally, is a reference to water baptism. That when Jesus talks about being born again of water and the spirit, he's referring to the sacrament, which you receive the water and the Holy Spirit simultaneously. That this is not just, I made a personal commitment for Christ with no water and me just deciding just me and Jesus, that language cuts out both the water and the spirit. Now, you could argue the Holy Spirit is implicit there, but the water isn't. At best, you've turned it into spirit and the spirit. But that's not what Jesus says. He says water and the spirit. And so that's uh, one of those critical kind of points of departure. Now, that not every Protestant believes that, but a lot of so-called born-again Christians, that's how they understand what it is to be born again. And it's, it's patently unbiblical as an interpretation. It totally misunderstands and misconstrues what the Bible is actually saying. And one of the ways that we know that is by listening to the early Christians about this. Well, and that's the key point of the book here is that exactly. right, you'll end up with just competing interpretations and they'll say, no, no, it is what the Bible actually says. You're misreading it. And so this is where, again, I think your book provides such a uh, a wonderful new set of eyes on the question by saying, well, we can disagree about how we interpret here. Let's take a look at what the earliest interpreters of this reality had to say about it and what they did about it. Yeah, and, and fascinatingly, this is actually what the early Christians themselves did. So I was just, last night, I was reading St. Vincent of Loren and his uh, commentorium. He, you know, he's from the fifth century, so early 400s. And his book is like, I think, 434. So he's not as early as we're dealing with here. But when he's talking about this, he says, look, left to their own devices, people reading the Bible come away with as many interpretations as there are people. And that's still something you hear Catholics saying all the time. This is not some new argument that we came up with in response to Protestantism. Uh, 
this is just like a reality. And so he looks at well, all of these heretics of his day. He says, you can't get through a page of their writings without them quoting the Old and New Testament, but they're just not understanding the meaning of the things that they're quoting. And so it's a really, it's a really remarkable kind of argument because he says, if we, need, if we want to understand not just the text, but the meaning of the text, we need to understand it in what he calls the, the ecclesiastical and Catholic sense of the Bible. And, and so to do that, he argues, we look at what did the earliest Christians believe. So this is fascinating because he's an early church father from our perspective, who's looking back at the people he considers early church fathers 200 years before. And he's doing exactly the thing that we're trying to do here in the book of just saying, okay, what was it the earliest Christians believed? Because if we can trust that Jesus taught and taught in a clear way and taught in a way that his followers understood, then we should be able to trust what his followers say his teaching was. Because otherwise, either they're all just acting in bad faith or Jesus wasn't a very good teacher. And neither of those is a very plausible kind of explanation. Yeah, people don't really think of it like that, though. They don't, they say, well, no. <laughs> Jesus obviously was a bad teacher because we have all these interpretations. Yeah, yeah so I mean, but it's a funny point it, like, when you say it like that. Yeah, if, if I taught, I mean, I, I did teach a class. I, I taught a comparative religions class at college. And if every one of my students came out unanimously believing I taught X when I actually taught Y, that's probably on me. It's hard to say that's, that's their fault if you know 25 of them come away with the wrong idea. So likewise, if we're saying that thousands of Christians all misunderstood what Jesus said, and, and fascinatingly all misunderstood it in the same Catholic way, that's a really strange, very implausible kind of argument. And it really does call into question our Lord's ability to teach. So today I'm talking with Joe Heschmeyer about his book, The Early Church Was the Catholic Church. Again, go to catholic.com, click on the shop button. You can get a copy of this book for yourself. Joe, let's dive into this because um, it's not only how does baptism appear in the New Testament as it continues on in the uh, writings of the earliest witnesses, but in the life of the church and its meaning. And you bring up the important reality of regeneration. Is there something that is more than just a symbolic gesture that says, I now associate myself with Christ or the community? Is there something deeper and more transformative going on? Yeah, and this is, this is very much the hinge. This is the doorway to the church. This is how you become a child of God. This is how your sins are forgiven. This is how you receive the Holy Spirit. And this is what the early Christians believed. Again, seemingly without exception. And so in the book, I actually quote a Protestant scholar um, by the name of Everett Ferguson. And he says that although in developing the doctrine of baptism, different authors had the particular favorite descriptions, there's a remarkable agreement on the benefits received in baptism. And he's looking not just the first 200 years, but the first 500 years. And he's, he points out that there's two fundamental blessings that are often repeated. The baptized person receives forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then uh, that this is understood as uh, a sharing in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ with all the attendant benefits and responsibilities and regeneration from above. And then he, he cites to John 3, 5 there. And regeneration is just another way of saying rebirth. That is what it is to be born again. That you are reborn, you are regenerated, you are born anew or a, again. All of that are just different ways of saying that the thing Jesus says in John 3, the thing that's prophesied to Ezekiel about the sprinkling of waters to turn your stony hearts into natural hearts, uh, the promises that, that St. Peter makes in Acts 2 about what to do to be saved, like all of these things the answer here is water baptism. And uh, it's all over the place in the Old and New Testament, if you know where to look. But this is more remarkable when you realize that the early Christians understood it again, just constantly. They would point to these same texts in places that we wouldn't always even think to look uh, and make these points about what it is to be born again, what water baptism does, and the like. Well, it, it gets to this idea, ideas matter, right? Yeah. And so if you say, I've accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. I'm born again. So therefore, let me go confirm that by being baptized versus, no, I want to express my desire to give myself over fully to Christ and what he's done for me. Therefore, let me be baptized. And now I'm entering into salvation. Ideas matter. And yeah, so they do. Well, and, and you know, you'll often find Protestants who are really hesitant to give any sort of efficacious effect to baptism. Mm -hmm. They'll say, well, baptism can't save. 
I actually had a really remarkable back and forth with a, a street preacher about this. I originally went over just to thank the guy for being bold enough to proclaim Christ in the public square. But when he found out I was Catholic, he decided that we needed to argue instead. And he starts saying, uh, you guys are totally wrong about baptism, which I love that he went there. And I said, no, it, it says that baptism saves you in scripture. And he said, it does not say that in the Bible. And I said, what does your Bible say in 1 Peter 3.21? And he, he pulls out and he just reads aloud, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. And he just was like dumbstruck for a second. And then he's like, well, Peter was talking to people who are still under the law. And it's just like, no, like, what are you talking about? Like, it, he just hadn't known this verse existed. But it, it really is that kind of light bulb moment that this is something that's huge and that this idea really matters. And one of the reasons, and the reason I'm sharing this is because he thought of baptism as a work that we do for God. And our works, according to Protestant theology, can't have any kind of merit. They can't have any kind of efficaciousness. And so baptism can't be of any use. And so none of the verses that Protestants arguing against baptism use even mention baptism. They're just talking about like needing faith. But the Catholic understanding isn't that baptism is a good work that we're doing for God. Our understanding is that it's a sacrament, which is to say it's something God is doing for us, that we agree to go along with it but we don't actually, like, we can't just pull the Holy Spirit down in, in baptism any more than we can turn the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ on our own, any more than we can become one flesh and that God has joined together kind of sense. Like, even that language, what God has joined together, shows us who's the actual actor in the sacraments, and it's not us. Well, Joey, it kind of points us to, like, a Catholic way of viewing the world as sacramental. Mm -hmm. And there's there are certain streams of uh protestantism that would say kingdom of god kingdom of the world is separated and you don't have you come out from one to the other right and so that that is a fundamentally different mindset there's no room to to say god is going to work in a sacramental way that he's going to use the things he's created to communicate the the supernatural grace that he wants to give to us yeah the danger is that you end up with something like gnosticism a rejection of the body a rejection of creation is good when you look at the actual ministry of jesus it's really earthy mm -hmm. uh you know he spits at one point he spits on a guy's tongue it's he doesn't get much more nitty-gritty than that you know uh, all of these real direct encounters through physical objects from the wedding feast of cana onward he could do everything remotely, entirely in a spiritual, immaterial sort of way, but that would defeat the point of the incarnation in no small way. That he, right. he constantly is working visible miracles. But until that, see, that's you talking like a Catholic again, right? Because if you talk about Luther's experience of coming to realize that he's saved, it's this existential experience of the spirit. You know, it's dislocated from the, the bodily realities and in all of that. So again, that's the battle. That's the uphill. It, it is absolutely it's the uphill mindset that we're, mm -hmm. that we're working against. And I think that your book, the early church was the Catholic church. It does provide a, a wonderful corrective for that. Um, Joe, I want to move on to the, the next main section where you do the a similar thing by focusing on the Eucharist and um, folks, again, as I'm sharing this page with you, the early church was the Catholic church. It's right there on Catholic Answers website. Just go down to the shop link and then you can get it. And you can buy the book, not only a soft cover, but you can get an ebook and you can also get a case of books as well, um, which you can get at a, a, a fundamental, dis a wonderful discount. Um, if you wanna get a, a bulk uh, set of copies of 20, it's only $3 each. Do a book study on it. You can uh, hand them out uh, to, to Catholics that who want to understand more about their Catholic faith. Wonderful options there, Joe. Um, Joe, again, so he is a, a staff apologist at Catholic Answers uh, joining me today on the program. Joe, I want to um, dive into the Eucharist because in that chapter, we're going to bump up against some of the same themes about mm -hmm. the physical reality, symbolic versus communicative of God's life and grace. But you focus in there on, on certain um, ways of understanding the Eucharist that, again, can, can be contrasted, meal versus sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And so um, what was it that, was there anything as you did an exploration of the first two centuries uh, that you found surprising or particularly helpful for Catholics? Yes. So talking about the Eucharist is often really difficult in Catholic Protestant conversation. And the reason it's difficult, so I'm from Kansas, so I'm originally from Missouri, but I'm from the middle of the country where if you meet a Protestant, there's a good chance they're either Baptist or non-denominational, which is basically Baptist without as much structure. Uh, and, and so their views 
of the Eucharist are really Zwinglian, that they're really heavily indebted to Zwingli, who, who viewed the Eucharist just as a symbol. But there are other Protestants, especially in the Calvinist tradition and the Lutheran tradition, that have a, a richer sacramental theology of the Lord's Supper, but it's still not the Catholic one. And so it can be really confusing. You can get lost in the weeds really quickly about the Lutheran versus the Catholic versus the Calvinist versus the Baptist view. And so I find it helpful to really clear the air by just saying, well, do you think the Eucharist is Jesus? Should we worship the Eucharist? And every well-formed Catholic will say yes to that. And, and every Protestant who's well-formed in Protestantism will say no to that. And it really shows, okay, well, we don't need to argue about, is there some way God can be spiritually present among bread and wine? Because that, while that may be true, it may be fine. God is present in my neighbor as well. And I don't worship my neighbor. Uh, so the question here is really, is the Eucharist Jesus? But then second, and this was the part that I was really dumbstruck by, is this idea of the sacrifice of the mass. Now, I'll tell you, before I went into this, I expected to find that the, the first articulations of the mass as sacrifice came later on. I expected it to be a somewhat late thing, not as a betrayal of early belief, but just to find that more explicitly articulated uh, kind of later in church history. And that wasn't the case at all. What I found is that Malachi 1, verses 10 to 11, which talk about uh, a sacrifice being offered to God from the rising of the sun to its setting by the Gentiles, that from the first century, we find people explicitly quoting this text to explain what the Eucharist is and how the mass works, that the Eucharist is the fulfillment of God's promise through Malachi, that this is how you can have this worldwide sacrifice offered by the nations, offered even by the Gentiles, uh, that's pleasing to God, that it's because of the sacrifice of the mass. And what made it even more shocking is that the reformers knew this. So Martin Luther, one of his lamentations during the Reformation is that in his words, quote, there is no belief in the church more generally received or more firmly held than that the mass is a good work and a sacrifice. So it's not just like, you know, one or two people believe this. This is one of those points where Luther says, you know, I'm Noah and everyone besides me is, uh, you know, a hellbound sinner. And then John Calvin uh, argues that Satan somehow not only obscured and perverted, but altogether obliterated and abolished the Lord's Supper because he blinded almost the whole world into the belief that the mass was a sacrifice and oblation uh, for obtaining the remission of sins. So in other words, both Luther and Calvin very explicitly do two things. One, they grant that everybody else treats the Mass as a sacrifice. And two, they make it very clear that they don't be the Mass as a sacrifice. That this is one of those issues in which all of those different Protestant strands, whether it's, you know, Lutheran or Calvinist or Baptist, Anabaptist, you know, you name it, there's going to be a shared rejection of the idea of the Mass as sacrifice. And yet everyone on earth prior to the Reformation believed the Mass was a sacrifice. And as both Luther and Calvin point out, this is something that you'll find among the theologians and the common people. And it's in the text of the Mass itself. And it's in the writings of the early church fathers. So it's all over the place. It really is one of those issues. So if you're going to say the Mass isn't a sacrifice, which every Protestant, if they're consistent, is bound to argue, you've got to say everybody on earth, basically got this one wrong for 1500 years. And that is a really hard position to sell. Well, I, and I think that it, they're intimately connected. If it's really Christ, then it's really a sacrifice. If it's just symbolically Christ, then there is no sacrifice. It's all in the past. So yeah. those two seem to be intimately connected. Right, because it's a symbol of what has already happened and that is not still ongoing. Whereas the Catholic view is that, no, no, it's still made present in every mass. Yeah. Well, and again, it seems to me it's the sacramental principle again, but this time in the dimension of time, right? That yeah. somehow God is able to link moments of time together in a rich way. Well, one of the things that I think is really striking about it, when you read the early Christians writing about this, as opposed to the reformers, these early Christians were either pagans or Jews, and they lived in a pagan or Jewish culture. And both pagans and Jews had sacrifice. They had animal sacrifice regularly. So they have a sacrificial theology already that makes sense. To give you just one example, in 1 Corinthians 10, there's this interesting part where Paul compares the table of the Lord, which is this communal meal that's sacrificial, 
to the table of demons, which is what pagans are doing in demonic sacrifice. And now a modern reader having no idea about Jewish temple worship, which he mentions, or about pagan sacrificial worship, which he mentions, this passage is, is inscrutable. But someone who is familiar with the theology of paganism or Judaism knows the, the basic principles of sacrificial theology. And so this whole Protestant argument that it's re-sacrificing Christ is just born out of not knowing sacrificial theology. It's not understanding the way an early Christian or an early pagan or an early Jew would have made sense of, well, what does it mean to kill the animal? And then what happens when you eat the animal? That it's those two moments in time are part of, they're two aspects of one sacrifice. They're not two separate sacrifices. You're not re-sacrificing the lamb. You know, on Passover, you've got preparation day where you kill the lamb and Passover where you eat the lamb, but that's not two different sacrifices. Mm -hmm. That's one sacrifice in, in two modes, a bloody mode, shedding the animal's blood, and then the unbloody mode where you eat the, the blood, of, or the, you eat the flesh of the animal rather. So that's the understanding that's, that's behind the Eucharist. Preparation day is Good Friday. And Passover is, is Holy Thursday in every mass sense. That's not a re-sacrifice of Christ. So, Joe, I'm talking with Joe Heschmeyer again. He's a staff apologist at Catholic Answers and joining me today to talk about his book, The Early Church Was the Catholic Church. Go to Catholic.com, click on the shop button. You can get yourself a copy of The Early Church Was the Catholic Church. Joe, you bring me into like downstream into your book to the next issue, which you have folks listening to this that are Protestant and they'll say, aha, here it is. Constantine reinstituted this priesthood and the sacrifice. It's going backwards. It's becoming pagan. It's reverting to Old Testament mentality because then is where we see the first signs of the priesthood. And in your next chapter in the book, you talk about, hey, wait a minute. Let's take a look at the concept of apostolic succession. Let's see what form it actually takes in the first two centuries. And lo and behold, what do we discover? Yeah, we discover, for instance, uh, St. Clement, the first Clement in probably the year 96, writes in what appears to be comparing the threefold structure of the New Testament, a bishop, presbyter, we'll later say priest, and uh, deacon, how that's a fulfillment of the high priest, priest, and Levite in the Old Testament. And so it's just like, it's a, a brief kind of reference, but it's really kind of striking. Then you get Ignatius of Antioch, where it's not a brief reference, in which he says, if you don't have bishop, presbyter, deacon, you don't have the church. But the church is, in its essence, that's the structure. We, we are not, as Christians, given the ability to choose whatever structure we want, because we didn't build the church. Jesus did. Jesus says in Matthew 16, I will build my church. And so our job is to receive the structure given to us by Christ and the apostles and not to invent it for ourselves. And so that's like, that's at the heart of this. Um, well, and, and Joe, I'll and just stop you there for a second, because it's uh, when I hear Protestants um, lay out a theology of ministry, they'll often refer to Ephesians in this fourfold mm -hmm. form of mm -hmm. ministry, right? Where they have the apostles and the prophets, evangelists and teachers. Mm -hmm. And somehow they think that, oh, that's good enough. And then you can just parachute 20 centuries ahead and apply them instead of saying, no, wait a minute, let's just take a look a little bit downstream to the year 96 and let's see what Clement says and let's see what the, uh, let's see uh, what the Ignatius says. And all of a sudden we have Bishop, Priest, Deacon really yeah, clearly well, solidified. Uh, Leon Morris, another evangelical I quote in the book, in the Evangelical Dictionary of Theology, he makes a point that nowhere do we find evidence of a violent struggle as it be natural if a divinely ordained congregationalism or Presbyterianism were overthrown. Mm -hmm. So I want to pause on that line because it's really interesting. Because the Protestant claim seemingly isn't just that God wished that everyone would be congregationalist or Presbyterian or what have you in the future, but that he actually set up that structure and that somebody tinkered with it, that they abolished something Christ has set up and put their own man-made structure in its place. And what makes this weirder as a claim is that this happened seemingly in every little church all over the world, and nobody ever complained about it. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever wrote, this is the worst thing. How would they abolish something established by Christ? I mean, because Clement, in First Clement, talks about it in chapter 42, how Christ gives the structure to the apostles, the apostles give it to us, and it's not ours for the choosing. It's ours for the receiving. So well, and you bring up idea. a really important point in your book, too, when you identify this early custom of having lists of bishops. Yeah, exactly. So 
Irenaeus talks about this, Hegesippus talks about this, Tertullian talks about this, that the early Christians literally kept paper rolls, or, you know, had not paper literally, but kept rolls of every bishop who had ever been head of their church. So we know there was a single bishop because it wasn't just, oh, it, 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 this snapshot in 150, we find a bishop. But no, we can say who that bishop's predecessor was and who the predecessor was all the way back to the apostles. And so in the case of the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, St. Irenaeus gives us a list of those 13 bishops from the time of the apostles to the year 180 when he's writing. And so we know exactly who was in office. We know exactly who was there. And it becomes very implausible to say, well, maybe the Christians doctored the evidence or they just invented these kind of legendary stories and the like. Like, no, no, they, they were keeping records. So, you know, the kids today would say they've got the receipts. They, you know, like they understand, like they have the actual evidence to prove what they're saying is true because they've got these ancient records uh, that, that demonstrate it. So, so Joe, let's, yeah. uh, um, we're going to be running out of time here. And I want to get you to your final point, which sure. is a beautiful way that you back into it in your book. Um, we have, typically we have folks beginning with the Bible and then from there trying to figure out what happened at the time of Christ. And then, they, then you can kind of use that to interpret what's happening today. You start with the early church, the evidence of the earliest uh, authors and witnesses. And then from there, you're able to identify this tradition of teachings in critical matters like baptism and Eucharist. You move into, let's call it magisterium, apostolic authority and succession. And then you lead to, hey, wait a minute, inspired writings. We have the scriptures. So it's a fascinating flow that you have in your book. So in, in the last few minutes here, talk about uh, the earliest uh, identification of the gospels. Yeah, so the first person, I actually alluded to this earlier, the first person to give us all four gospels explicitly is St. Irenaeus. And we get a partial list before that in 160, but because we only have a fragment of it, we only know the third and fourth gospels are Luke and John. Uh, but it's seemingly, it's, it's still, you know, that's from the moratorium fragment. Uh, sorry, that's actually probably the 140s. But either way, it's an incomplete list that tells us there were four gospels, and we know the names of two of them. But the first time we get Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John explicitly without controversy is Irenaeus. And we've already heard about him. He's this incredibly Catholic guy. And so this creates this really kind of fascinating issue that um, Protestants and anyone who rejects the early Christian witness on this is in a weird spot if they're going to try to accept the Bible. And it's certainly if they're going to try to use the Bible against uh, the early Christians. So in the book, um, I quote D.A. Carson. Who, Don Carson, he's with Gospel Coalition, prominent evangelical guy, has a commentary on John in which he argues that we can trust Irenaeus when he talks about the four Gospels because of his personal connection with Polycarp who knew John, which means, in his words, the distance in terms of personal memories is not very great. But then this same D.A. Carson, when he gets to John 6, says, well, yes, Ignatius of Antioch, this student of John's, is a sacramentarian. But, you know, error can creep in. And so it's really remarkable that he's going to say, on the one hand, we can trust the line from John to uh, Polycarp to Irenaeus that goes 80 years after the death of John. That's close enough in terms of personal memories, even though Irenaeus didn't personally meet John, was born after John had died. But we can't trust it between John and one of his two students, Ignatius, seven years after he died. It, I mean, it's just such a bizarre argument to make that, to say, you know, error can creep in within seven years, but it can't creep in within 80. It, it just leads to this kind of nonsensical position. So in the book, I really argue that Protestants should be consistent. Either say we can trust the early Christians. That doesn't mean that every single word that comes out of everyone's mouth is true. But when you find a universal teaching and it, they claim it goes back to the apostles, that's really good evidence that it goes back to the apostles. Trust that. If you take that, you end up in Catholicism. If you take the other view and says, you know, they're not reliable, they modified teachings, they compromise with paganism, you don't end up in Protestantism, you end up in agnosticism, you end up in a situation where you can't even accept the Bible, because on what authority, you know, this is one of your unanswerable questions, right? Like, how do we know we got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John right, much less the entire New Testament or the entire Bible? Well, if we can't trust the people who preserved and compiled those books and uh, attest to their apostolic origins, then we've got no basis upon which to do that, that isn't circular. 
right? And it wasn't just consensus, right? There was right. Uh, there was an element of apostolic authority here that yeah. was underlying all of it. And, but and even when Protestants protection. argue consensus, they're arguing consensus of people whose consensus they reject. Yeah. Because there's also a consensus on baptism, also a consensus on the Eucharist. So right. even when you find a total consensus on like the Gospels, mm -hmm. if you can't trust them in consensus, how can you trust them in consensus over here? Well, it's kind of a soft, selective consensus is what right. it is, right? right? If so, they agree with me, then that, I trust that consensus. But well, then you don't really care about their authority at all. But that's, isn't that part of the challenging point is that if they're beginning with their faith that they bring into the question, then they're going to be kind of stuck to try to find a way to interpret the evidence that shows up there. I, I had a Protestant friend who asked me what test he would need to end up with the 66 book Protestant Bible. Like what standard do I need to apply to make sure I get these books and no other books? Mm -hmm. I couldn't think of one, but it was such a fascinating question because he wasn't even pretending that he was trying to just do it neutrally. He started with the conclusion he needed to get to and was trying to figure out a means to get there. So it is, like, that is certainly a problem. And so in the book, I try to address that and just say, don't, don't do that. Like either trust them or reject them, but neither way should you end up in this kind of hypocritical position that it seems like a lot of Protestants have taken of accepting them when convenient and rejecting them when they're not. Well, and, and let's, that's a great place to end is to come back to the beginning. I think the one of the best gifts of this book, and there are many in it, the early church was the Catholic church written by Joe Heschmeyer, is that you put into question the idea that the early church had it right, somewhere it went wrong, and that's where the Catholic church popped up. And somewhere there was this pristine period where things went, went awry. And instead, let's dig into that. Let's put that into question and let's take a look at the earliest witnesses and come to find out that their beliefs, their interpretations of what we would consider biblical teaching was in fact what the Catholic Church taught about the most important matters, baptism, Holy Eucharist, apostolic authority, uh, the, the scriptures themselves, and what is the basis for their being identified as inspired word of God that it, it, the Catholic approach, uh, scripture, tradition, magisterium is the one that has a validity. It has a warrant based on history in a way that the others just don't. Well said. That's Joe Heschmeyer, a Catholic uh, apologist and staff apologist at Catholic Answers, uh, the author of the book, The Early Church Was the Catholic Church. Joe, thank you so much for being with me today. Oh, the pleasure was mine. That's a great conversation. I really enjoyed it.